Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Kevin Rorty, part one. We'll hear a reflection from Kevin and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight, our guest is Kevin Rorty. He's here to talk about his organization, Souls of the Christian Apostolate. And this apostolate is aimed at fostering people to grow in their prayer life, their interior life. It has an accountability aspect to it and a teaching aspect of how to pray, how to, how to do mental prayer. And God calls us into a relationship, a communion with himself. But learning how to plug into all that is really where Kevin's gonna help guide us and uh, so that we do enrich our spiritual lives. So we're now going to a reflection with Kevin. In the words of St. Teresa of Avila, remember that you have one soul, that you have one death to die, that you have one life which is short and can be lived by you and you alone. And there is one glory which is eternal. If you do this, there will be many things about which you care nothing. What are we investing our time, our energy, our desires on in this life? Is it in eternity or is it in things of this world? With Christ in baptism, we are destined for the beatific vision, life with the Trinity forever, eternal ecstasy with God, sharing in his own inner life. Without that, we are nothing. We live death. What are we doing with our time to prepare, to have a foreshadowing of what that eternal life is really going to be like? We should do a real examination. Are we committing to spending that time conversing with Christ, God who dwells in our souls? What a priceless jewel, a pearl of great price that Christ talks to us about, the treasure hidden in a field. That's worth more than any investment in this life, all the investments put together. What a great gift that God has given us that we all share in the interior life through baptism, nourished in the sacraments. I really exhort you and encourage you to try to find some accountability, to try to find real commitment to this daily habit that will change your life, your family's life, and the whole church. Well, Kevin, welcome to Life on the Rock. It's great having you here, and you are the founder of SOCA, the Souls of the Christian Apostolate. And, uh, but I wanted to ask you, how, what is your own, kind of a briefly, what is your own faith journey? Well, thanks for having me here, brother. It's an honor to be here. Well, I was raised as a cradle Catholic, mm -hmm. common to most young Catholics today. I started living a very wayward lifestyle, uh, going to public school mm -hmm. all the way through 12th yeah. grade. You can imagine what that's Same like. Here. <laughs> yeah, in uh, yeah. Colorado of all okay. places, all those Colorado bros, you yeah. know. And uh, I hit, uh, crux in my life where I was on a retreat in confirmation mm. and I had a realization that God is a living God, that Christ is living and he's calling me to live for him. Uh, and, and I knew that that feeling was very real and tangible, but that it wouldn't last. And I had a real juncture in my life. I had to decide what direction I was going to go in with my life. And I ended up speaking with a priest who introduced me to the concept or the practice of daily meditation or mental prayer, mm -hmm. basically where you converse with Christ in your soul for 15, 20, 30 minutes a day in silence. And I started practicing that and it totally changed everything wow. for me in the faith. How I perceived the faith before then was more dry, yep. washed up yeah. way of living, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a lukewarm, typical experience at your parishes where it was then transformed to God is a living God. I have to live for him. And I saw things from a totally new lens. What triggered that? What was it? Was there anything in particular? Well, I, I think I'd experienced the shallowness and the, the emptiness of modern living for sure. Oh. The pleasures that just don't last, yeah. the false ambitions of living for worldly ends, the false vanity and popularity. Yeah. And so I, I realized I'm living for nothing and I, my yeah. soul thirsted for depth. Yeah, I think kind of a disillusion sets in. You know, with the way, especially when you're young, trying to yeah. grow up, things are, you have these expectations. And a lot of times they don't, they're not met, <laughs> you yeah. know, and it can kind of make you kind of confused about the world. But I always think of the scripture of 
vanity of vanities and all is vanity whenever our, our lives are just grounded in this world. But yeah, the fact that God, you know, called you out, you know, the fact, you know, you're young too. You're on a, was it confirmation retreat? Yeah, I was in ninth, 10th you know, grade. To learn how to pray, you know, and I know I didn't really pray at that age on my own. Prayed with my parents, you know, at church, but really forming that habit of prayer wasn't part of who I was either. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the big need today. You know, yeah. once I had some form of accountability with that and, and learning how to do it, it changed everything. And that's when I look around at my peers, you know, and those who are in mm -hmm. high school and college right now, what are they fed? Yeah. You know, they're fed so much junk oh, for their yeah. souls. Yeah. Uh, it's no wonder that souls are, you know, priests said they're, they're like walking zombies. Their <laughs> souls are dead, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, anyway, that kind of inspired me. I ended up, after high school, I went to religious life in France, uh, and I received, I think, some of the mm -hmm. best contemplative formation oh, yeah. you can get in the yeah. church's wisdom today. Um, and so that introduced me to deep prayer. Uh, living it in a very deep way. And yeah. I discerned I had a call to go and evangelize. And so I left religious life, I discerned with their blessing to go to become a, a missionary, a lay missionary. Uh, and I was with Focus, okay. a college missionary organization. And there learned a lot of the practicals uh, of how to reach people in yeah. the modern world today. Oh, yeah. and, and so I had these experiences of what I needed was depth in a very shallow world. Uh, receiving that depth in religious life with the contemplative life, experiencing the living God in the depths of our souls, and then evangelization, trying to share the faith yeah. with when others. When you were a focused missionary, what did you maybe perceive as what keeps people away from faith? I would imagine you probably ran into some of that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the faith, yeah. but I honestly think it's deeper than just that. I think it's the attachments to so many pleasures yeah. of the world. Uh, and and not knowing the real depth of the faith. Mm -hmm. They don't know um, the, the four last things. They don't know what's going to happen when I die. They don't think about it, and they're never told that there is a heaven and there's a hell, and that we need Christ mm -hmm. to save our souls, to go to heaven for all yeah. of eternity, and, and ultimately just to have fulfillment. Yeah. The, they're not told that there's a lot of watered-down message, so they're not told these things, and then they're fed all these pleasures, and it's just a... It's just a whirlwind uh, that mm -hmm. leads to, you know, for every individual who enters a church, six leave, 70% yeah. don't believe in the real presence. You can go on and on, um, you know, 80% of the people that leave or something like that, and they leave in college, or 80% yeah. of college yeah. students leave the faith. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, I just think it's important that we as a church recognize the need is really for their souls, not to just to bring them into a club, but to, to say, here's your eternal path. Christ is the answer, and he will give your soul the deepest nourishment that it yeah. really needs. I think there's a huge misconception out there today that young people aren't interested in religion. I think actually whenever I was in college, I think they're probably the most open people. But again, I think it's kind of what they're fed too in the process yeah. that also matters because it's, it's not, because you're learning how to think on your own. You're kind of just out in the world trying to figure out a lot of things, maybe marriage or your career and all that. And, you are kind of hitting all these big questions that religion has been answering for a long time, but I found there is quite an openness, although there might be a resistance, but I think that resistance is often misplaced. So I totally agree. Yeah. I think that people are searching for answers uh, in many cases, but we're afraid often to give the hard answers. I mean, Colorado is a perfect example right. of yeah. your typical, like I said, Colorado bro, you know, that is seeking some kind of transcendent experience. Mm -hmm. The church has contemplation. That's what their soul is really seeking. Yeah. Not these false experiences that the world provides. Oh, uh, yeah. And there, there's a lot of that, you know, that, you know, we're driven in so many different directions in our culture and society. You know, we ask, you know, basically, what is truth? As Pontius Pilate did, you know, we don't even know half the time our own humanity. You know, what is a man? You know, some of these very yeah. basic principles, you know, and there's another voice out there in the world that's trying to, I think a lot of times, distort or suppress or just keep away people knowing the gospel truth, those gospel principles that are so vital to our spiritual lives, yep. you know, and just to have that navigation in the world today, it's tricky. It's very tricky for a young person, but to have that is so important. So we got to go to a break, but whenever we come back, let's get into what is SOCA? Great. Okay.
So Kevin, let's talk about your apostolate. What is SOCA? SOCA stands for Souls of the Christian Apostolate. And it is a ministry that really begins with honing in on what is the actual problem we're facing in the mm -hmm. world and in the church today. Well, if you look at all the things that we, trying to be faithful Catholics, see as issues, abortion, contraception, people leaving the church, mm -hmm. like we said, yeah. for every one that comes in, six leaves, at least that's a stat that's thrown around, uh, belief in the Eucharist, uh, how, how do you raise your kids well? Like, you know, yeah. politics, there's so many things that you can get into it's these bombardment. days. bombardment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we are in a post-Christian society, yeah, that's oh, yeah. for sure. Uh, but we have to ask ourselves, what is at the core of all of this? At the end of the day, there is a heaven and there's a hell. Mm. And our Lord said there is one thing necessary. And the church has interpreted that as the interior life. His life dwelling in us, where we come into contact with the living God, just yeah. like that changed my whole life, right? right? And uh, that's what the saints always recommend, is investing in that capital of sanctifying grace, his life, the trinity dwelling in our souls, and, and investing in it by communing with God, mm. friendship with Christ. Right. The only way you can have friendship is by spending time together, communing, conversing, being with them. And that's what the practice of mental prayer or meditation, there's lots of forms and words, yeah. Lexio Divina, basically any activity where you set aside specific time with the end of coming into contact with the living God. Wow, yeah. uh, and so that's, that's what Soka aims to do, um, is to help people commit to mental prayer because the saints really emphasize that this is what's gonna lead souls to heaven, yeah. to save souls. Of all the problems out there, we need to save souls from hell and build up saints. Um, St. Teresa says that the devil knows he's lost a soul who perseveringly practices mental prayer. Yeah. St. Alphonsus says that mental prayer is morally necessary for salvation, and all the saints became saints through mental prayer. Yeah. So this is, this is the key practice. I think that's so important because, you know, Archbishop Fulton Sheen in his book, uh, Characters of the Passion, when there's a reflection on Peter, whenever he, he goes into how Peter fell, the first thing he neglected was prayer. Mm. You know, you see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, they're not, you know, prayer is that vigilance, keeping watch, you know, and we find the apostles, you know, the, uh, those that are going to, you know, bring this gospel to the world, they're asleep, you know, and Christ has to awaken them over and over yeah. again just to stay awake. And I think that's so critical just to have that spiritual awakening, you know, to be on guard, to be vigilant, because there's a lot of stuff out there in the world, but prayer is kind of what teaches a Christian to be vigilant. Right, and what we need are on fire people. Mm -hmm. When you look at these problems, I mean, we can say we have victories here and there, yeah. but the problems in our culture are so deep. If we just have a victory in one political sense or yeah. with certain values on a natural level, that's important, but we really have to get to the, the source of it all, which is we need Christ in our society, and that begins living it out in our own souls. Mm -hmm. Our Lord said, you know, there will be many people who said, I, I did this for you in society, or I, I stuck to these principles. Um, and they say, I, I, oh, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, depart from me, for I know you not. Mm. We have to know Christ. Right. John 17, 3, for this is eternal life, to know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Uh, and that has to, that you, we have to spend the time doing that every day. Yeah. I think, too, I always kind of go back to the whole, you know, just that spiritual awakening, what kind of makes a person think differently about Christianity, or kind of what was it? And I know in my own life, there was a very concrete and definite, you know, point where it's like you're hearing something that just sounds, it passes itself off as Christian, but then you go, is that really what Christ taught? You know, and for me, that was a big kind of a crossroad, was, you know, whose voice am I really listening to? And I think whenever we do pray, it really trains us how to listen to that one voice. You know, there's totally. only one voice we should be listening to, and that's Christ. Yeah, the, the way that a, a great theologian describes the interior life is, what is the conversation going on in your heart, in your mind, when you're alone in a room? Mm. Are your thoughts directed toward just daily things you're doing? Are they egotistical thoughts? Mm. Are they sinful in other ways? Um, are, is it dead inside? Or it, it, are your thoughts toward God, oriented toward God, conversing with Him? And the more we grow in the interior life, the more the, that inner conversation we have with ourselves 
becomes a conversation with God in various ways. Wow. And so what have been, how have you seen SOCA, how has it grown over the last years? Well, it began as really just a missionary effort on my own to help, try to help mm -hmm. people to commit to mental prayer. I'm coming out of being a focused missionary. You know, I continued a missionary lifestyle and for maybe six months, you know, living off of very little yeah. uh, just to get started. And uh, now we're on year five after all of that. We've done things like one-on-one -on -one discipleship and mentorship to small group Bible study type of settings to a chapter model to uh, events and conferences. And uh, we're at the point now where our main things are we help people commit by giving them what's called our 12-step interior path mm. that walks people through why do mental prayer? What is it? Like, what are the steps involved in it? And then how do I stay committed? That's really the big thing. Yes. And so that's the second part is not just giving them the resources, but giving them accountability um, to develop this habit as if your life depends on it, because in a way it does. Okay. And where do you see the future of the church? Well, I think when we look at, uh, again, all the problems in the church today, it's very critical we recognize that the church is getting much smaller mm -hmm. and in 20 years it could look vastly different. Oh, yeah. I talked to some other young, some young priest who they say, I, I just wonder what my life is going to be like in 20 years. You know, yeah. Way less parishes and uh, fewer Catholics, far fewer priests and we have to be prepared for this remnant. You know, uh, Father Ratzinger in the 60s, that future Pope Benedict the 16th warned us basically prophesied about a future church that would be much smaller. Mm -hmm. But in that church, it could be purified and much richer oh, because yeah. it will be more of a voluntary society. Right. And I think we have to see the interior life, the daily practice of spending time with Christ as absolutely foundational, the, the, the norm, so to speak. And so that's Soka's vision is if just 1% of Catholics practice daily mental prayer, the whole world and the whole church would be totally renewed. But we're not even close to that right yeah. now. And where can we find more about SOCA? Uh, you can go to our website, socacatholic.org, S-O-C-A, catholic.org, and you can sign up and commit to mental prayer and get that 12-step interior path yourself. Well, Kevin, we've run out of time, but this is the one part of a two-part show, so we'll come back, we'll get more into the interior life and all that. But thank you for being on Life on the Rock and sharing us with your apostolate. So, awesome. Thank you very much, you. brother. God bless. You all had a great conversation, struck by so many mm -hmm. points in it. And one was just his conversion point, that God is a living God, yeah. and he wants us to live for him. But he's a God of power and wisdom, as Paul says, and that changes our life. Yeah, yeah. I think it's always amazing to just reflect on the Gospels. That, you know, the apostles, they came into very close contact with Jesus, you know, in the flesh. That you know, there's a God that created them, that He loves them, that He's teaching them, that He's there with them through everything. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you see that friendship that forms between Christ and the apostles. Right. And Christ loved them all, you know? And I think that's really at the heart of Christianity, forming that communion with God. You know, because it's so easy to get separated from that through sin. Right. We just, our minds, they go off course. We never think of God. We never think of the gospel truths. We never think of religion. Right. We just live for today. We just try to acquire whatever, yeah. and we're unhappy. We're, we become miserable. I think that's a great point, though, about, you know, you think about those who lived at the time of Christ, they knew him. You just mm -hmm. naturally have a relationship with him. You naturally talk to him. And does Christianity just end there? No, right? <laughs> You're supposed to go out and make disciples of all the nations. So we need to foster that same kind of friendship, that yeah. same conversation, like the original group had, and we can do that through mental prayer, through carving out the space and time to put energy into it. And I like the point he made too about just, you know, how attached we are to mm. the pleasures of the world. That's maybe our biggest block, you yeah. know, that we're so distracted, we're so caught up and, and divided, you know, in our tension, our hearts. Um, you know, that is so difficult at times to overcome. And I think we kind of, set ourselves to say, you know, this will make me happy of what's just rooted in this mm -hmm. life. A lot of times it can be expressed through entertainment or some kind of drug or even some kind of gaming thing that you get so attached, but there's no fulfillment right. and there's no, and no happiness. Depth. There's no depth. Yeah, no depth. 
And, you know, and over time, people do begin to aware, become very aware of that, mm -hmm. that you start saying there's got to be something more than this life, than what I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah. And there is. <laughs> well, I like the point you made about, you know, the church has answers for this, especially like young people who have deep questions yeah. about life. What's the meaning of life? And, and in prayer, we discover that meaning. And uh, you all are going to do a second show where yeah. that comes out more deeply. But uh, I, think, I think that was a great point that, you know, there are answers to these questions that we have in our hearts. And, and I think uh, it goes, you know, these questions may be new to us, but they're not new to the church. The church right. has been around for 2,000 right. years. Right. And every civilization and right. culture, one of the greatest thinkers, it has an answer. <laughs> right, right. Well, we'll send you into that vineyard with a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. May He send His Holy Spirit and give you the gift of prayer. May God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock. Ven con nosotros a mirar más allá.